Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, you see my email address and my Jabber account on the first slide. So if you're watching this on a video recording or if you cannot uh, get hold of the microphone in the end, please make comments. Please do contact me. And here is some way to, to get in touch with me. So I want to speak about yeah, how to know what a text is about in an unknown language which means in an unknown language to you or to me, not in a generally unknown language. This is a different topic which I can address perhaps next year in two years or at ICMP in summer, um, which is another camp, a smaller camp. But here it's about languages that somebody knows something about. Um, so, um, well, how to identify the language of a written text First of all, I will show traditional, traditional ways to do so, and then, of course, how to do it with the, help, with the help of computer technology. And the second part is about the question how to get at least some information out of an unknown text in an unknown language, in a language unknown to you. So the first question that comes up is what does it have to do with hacking? Well, I take a general definition of hacking, which I've taken from Eric Raymond's dictionary. It's the intellectual challenge of creatively overcoming and circumventing limitations. And we have a big limitations. We don't, we don't know 6,000 languages. And uh, well, sometimes we want to know what is there in a text in a language we don't know. And first of all, people say, well, that's impossible. We need a translator. We need a specialist. But I hope to show you that it is possible to get at least some insight in the first place in order to decide whether a translator is really needed or whether the text is totally uninteresting. So it is, I think it is important to make such a decision uh, before you get in contact with your translation department. Um, why don't I speak about spoken texts? Um, it is possible to do the same thing with, with spoken texts. There, there are approaches um, which work on a multi-language multi corpus of telephone calls. People have uh, <coughs> found ways to identify spoken text too, but uh, the strategies are somewhat different and I won't address them in my talk here. So I will stick to written languages, and the first thing, of course, is the writing system. Um, you get a text in a writing system, and if you are unfortunate, you get a text in Roman script. That's bad, because thousands of languages use Roman scripts, and those who usually don't use Roman scripts have a Roman transliteration system as well, so the text can be literally from thousands of languages. It gets better when you have a text in Cyrillic script because there are more or less, well, there are more than 60 languages, which is a lot, but, uh, well, it's less than, uh, than thousands. With Arabic, it's even better. With uh, Devanagari script, I will show uh, to you what that is later. It's only more than 10 languages that use that script. With Hebrew script, it's even less. And if it is another script, let's say Armenian script or Georgian script, well, there's just one language. So if you see the script, the, the writing system, you know what language it is. And lots of systems of uh, identifying languages uh, use that uh, fact. So they uh, try to find out what writing system that is and then they know what language it is. They can be wrong, of course. I tested some programs that um, <clears throat> I will mention later, and I just typed some random Korean signs, and the uh, program told me that the language was Korean. It wasn't Korean because I just uh, yeah, typed random signs. Yeah, <clears throat> so that is often used, and it's an easy way to get uh, to identify uh, languages. So I mentioned Devanagari. Here you have an idea what that looks like. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's a syllabic script used for uh, 
languages of India and Nepal, and uh, you can easily identify at least the script and perhaps languages with the, with the help of some books. Uh, there is, for example, um, a book by Karl Faulmann from the 19th century, and there are such lists, and you, you, you can see, well, you can uh, <coughs> browse through the book and find your script, and then you know, well, that must be Devanagari, and then uh, underneath there's a table with the languages that use Devanagari, and you get to it. The drawback of that book is that it doesn't have sample texts, which would be helpful to really identify the language. Um, but it has a great advantage because Faulmann was a, a typographer and he was interested in variants of scripts, so you get different uh, fonts for each script in the book and that makes life easy. So here's another font. Or you use the internet, there is a page called Omniglot, uh, which contains tables of scripts and sample text, and it explains to you how a script works. So here you see how Devanagari works. Um, there is uh, <coughs> as one sign uh, stands for a certain syllable. For example, the first one is pa, and then you can modify the vowel by modifying the sign. You add modifiers for a long R, that's the, the, the signs in red, or for E, for long E, and so, uh, for I, for long I, and so on. Yeah, or you use another book, uh, which is uh, in my bio uh, bibliography, uh, that's uh, a book by uh, Daniels and another author, um, which contains tables of very many different scripts, uh, writing systems, with sample text. So here's an example te uh, text of Armenian, and that helps a lot, because then you can really uh, identify a language, because well, when you just have a table of Devanagari signs, you don't know whether this is a Hindi or Nepali or so, but with the help of the sample text, it gets more easy. So uh, this book is really helpful. I used that. Uh, when I studied linguistics, which was before uh, we had the internet, so uh, it worked. <laughs> yeah, there was a time before internet. Now, there are some problems, some classical problems. For example, if you want to uh, identify a language in Hebrew script, so that there aren't that many, these are the usual uh, languages you find in Hebrew, and if you don't know uh, uh, the Hebrew writing system, it's difficult to uh, know uh, what language that, uh, which language the text um, is written in. But of course, um, you can, uh, well, there are hints uh, what language it is. For example, um, here you have uh, a text in Biblical Hebrew, and you can uh, recognize that rather easily, even without uh, knowing the writing system, because you don't have any Western uh, punctuation signs in it. They have strange punctuation signs like this one or that one. And yeah, that shows you that uh, this is probably not modern Hebrew and not Yiddish or uh, Ladino or something like that. Uh, and here you have uh, the same text in Yiddish, beginning of the Bible. And uh, you see you have uh, Arabic numbers, you have uh, Western punctuation signs. Of course, you find the same thing in Hebrew too, but uh, um, if you don't learn the, the signs, uh, if you compare a Hebrew and Yiddish texts uh, for, let's say, five minutes, uh, you get used to uh, um, the aspect. So um, Yiddish texts normally look more um, <coughs> Uh, well, the, the words uh, change quite a lot. There are long words and short words, and uh, some uh, short words always uh, come back. For example, the articles here, D or Dem, so uh, that makes it quite uh, easy to, to, uh, <coughs> uh, to identify Yiddish. And of course, there are special diacritics, so uh, uh, vowel signs in Yiddish, 
they are not always written. If you take a text from the Yiddish Wikipedia, you don't uh, see uh, these vowel signs, so that makes it difficult. But it's, it's not so uh, bad. Now, let's say you have a text in uh, uh, Roman script, in Roman writing system, uh, systems, so that gets uh, you into trouble because <laughs> there are so many languages. And it uh, used to be a problem, especially for uh, li librarians who had to identify what language a book is written in, and they used uh, tables like this table, which was uh, published by Ingle in 1980, and um, well, they, they looked up combinations of letters, and then there, there, there is a list of languages where these combinations uh, turn up. Uh, in some cases, it's rather easy. Uh, for example, take, take uh, um, this combination, so there's only one language. Number two, it's Esperanto, so that's easy. But uh, for very many combinations, there are a great number of languages, and you have to check several combinations. I tried that. And at least for the 60 languages uh, in that list, many European languages, it is quite easy to uh, identify the language. So here you see it, a little, an excerpt from that text. Yeah, now we come to computer-aided identification. Um, of course, you can do the same thing uh, with the computer. You can uh, count frequencies of unique characters and of character strings. Uh, this is a method that uh, is widely used in cryptanalysis, and it can be used to identify languages. Another approach is common words uh, recognition, um, which uh, is a method based on word frequency lists, which are generated from sample texts. And uh, the text can be uh, analyzed word by word and compared to the list of, let's say, the top uh, 100 words uh, in the frequency list. Um, can take time and so on. There's another approach which is, even, uh, which is used more often and is used in almost all the web applications that I found uh, <clears throat> on the internet. That is n-gram analysis. So uh, this analysis cuts the text into uh, uh, <clears throat> sequences of one or two or three items. So let's say our text is text. So in n-gram analysis, this uh, is um, <clears throat> transformed. This is uh, uh, yeah transformed into such sequences. So uh, this is a blank sign TE, then you have uh, text, then XT, and XT and the blank sign. So this is, um, <clears throat> these are triples, and you can, well, n-gram n means that you can well, analyze three, four, five such, uh, <clears throat> yeah, uh, sequences, like grams, so to speak. So anyway, it's always the same method you have a sample corpus, language corpus, you generate your models, and then you have the language models, and you compare your documents to these language models. You have the input document, you generate a model from the input uh, <coughs> document, then you compare the two, you can classify them, and then you, you, well, you can identify the language. There's one rather Ah, yeah, this, this procedure, of course, has certain drawbacks. Um, <clears throat> it is difficult to identify documents, uh, multilingual documents. It was pointed out to me yesterday that there are uh, approaches that can handle that. Um, and um, the other drawback is that, uh, uh, yeah, if you only have 30 <coughs> sample languages, uh, you can only identify 30 languages. And if you have 400, well, your recognition gets better. But it's, it's, uh, well, normally, uh, programs on the market don't have more than 400 languages in the sample base, and that's, uh, well, few. There is one nifty approach of uh, um, language identification. Um, 
which has been discussed lately. Um, it's a variant of the unique character string approach, uh, which is based on compression efficiency. So uh, you use a program like uh, gzip, um, you have a reference model, and you add a text in the language to be identified, then you apply your gzip, and you measure the compression efficiency. If it is the same language, the compression efficiency will be high. If it is not the same language, uh, you, your compression efficiency will be lower. So that's a good, a good way to identify languages. And it has some very interesting applications. First of all, you can measure linguistic difference. That is, you can use this approach to create language families, to, 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 well, to get to language families, to classify languages. And another interesting approach is that you can determine types of text. So, well, if you um, have, let's say, um, a corpus of email messages uh, as a reference model, and you add uh, well, text from, uh, uh, let's say, a newspaper article, the, the, this approach will show you that there's some difference between the texts. If you add, uh, let's say, a newspaper article to a newspaper article, the difference won't be that high. And uh, last night I discussed uh, whether this can be used for, whether uh, linguistic tools can be used for spam detection, and perhaps this could be a good way to uh, yeah, detect spam. Well, I, I don't know, just an idea. But, well, if I hadn't fought against uh, um, software patents, I would like to get a patent on that idea because it could work, could, could make some money out of it. Yeah, now let's see what there is on the internet. There are several programs, I've listed them here, that can be used to um, identify text. Most of them are um, web applications. There's one program which uh, work best because it has a basis of about 400, more than 400 languages, which is Polyglot 3000. Unfortunately, this is a closed source Windows freeware, and I don't even know what the method they, uh, what method they use. I suppose it's n-gram analysis, because I played a bit with it, and you can see that uh, it can correct certain errors and so on, and it looks like n-gram analysis but I don't really know. But this is, uh, was really the, the best. I tried some other languages. Normally the corpus uh, of reference models is too small, and uh, in some cases they don't tell you uh, which languages are in the corpus. And yeah, I, I uh, uh, tried with uh, uh, some, some languages from the Pacific Ocean, and they always told me that it was Frisian. Well, that, that's not good. Uh, but uh, actually, with, poly, uh, with Polyglot, it worked quite well. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, you can you look them up and you can try for yourself. It can be, well, it can be funny to, to uh, test these programs. Yeah, we now come to my second part, to, uh, well, content analysis, content analysis in... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, quotation marks because it's not really content analysis. Uh, it's just a dirty trick to get to know, to get an approximate idea what a text is about. Um, well, that's why I call it the hacker's approach. Um, well, if you have a text in an unknown language, and we will do that together with a text that I collected from the internet almost randomly. Um, uh, the first thing you can look for are numbers, dates, and words from other languages in your text, and that can help you to identify what the text is about. And you can follow typographic hints. There may be bold and italic print in your text. There can be colored te text <laughs> chunks or underlined text chunks or capital letters. Words with capital letters, well, it can be names. Um, that helps somehow. Yeah, and the other thing is, 
well, it's a little more, um, yeah, it has to do with statistics or linguistics. Um, if you can identify words in your text, that is quite helpful because there is a very interesting phenomenon which is called Zipp's Law. And Zipp's Law is the following. Well, it says that very frequent words are shorter and contain less lexical information, whereas infrequent words are longer and contain more lexical information. And at the same time, that's in addition to Zipp's Law from linguistics, less lexical information implies more grammatical information and vice versa. So what does that mean for our task of uh, getting to know what a language is about? Um, most interesting for us are words with more specific lexical information because they get us f farther and so we can ignore all short words, even if these short words are reiterated throughout the text. And that's a good uh, thing for us and that's how we can uh, get at least some information about a text. I will demonstrate that with a text in Roman script. Of course, there are writing systems that don't distinguish words. There are uh, writing systems like Devanagari, where sometimes words are written together. That makes it difficult. And there are writing systems like uh, Chinese, or, well, Japanese is a mixed system, um, where you have... Uh, um, <coughs> where you have signs for ideas, so ideograms, and there this approach doesn't work that good, although there is something similar. Um, really uh, meaningful signs that contain lots of lexical information are often more complicated than grammatical signs. So, well, at least for Japanese that works. Yeah, but let's stick to uh, uh, Roman script, so here is an example. Um, the first task for you is to identify the language. Of course, people who have followed discussions on Wikipedia about uh, um, signs to use ha have followed perhaps the discussion on this sign and will say, oh, it's Hawaiian. It's not Hawaiian, although this sign is Hawaiian. <laughs> and uh, a system for language identification which is based on uh, characters and character encoding will say perhaps that this is Hawaiian because of that sign, but it's not Hawaiian. So, uh, yeah, you get an idea very easily about uh, this language if you uh, follow my hint um, to look for uh, typographic uh, hints. So words with, written with capital letters. There are some words, and yeah, it's uh, Samoan, this language. Uh, actually, um, what is interesting, most texts in Samoan I found, that, that, I, that I found on the internet, um, contained the word Samoa. It's really <laughs> strange. <clears throat> And another interesting observation, I uh, use Google a lot to uh, find out what this text can mean. And just for test reasons, I typed in the word Tili. And of course, I didn't get any hint to Samoan. I get, got lots of television programs from France. When I did it again last night, just to, to do it again, uh, what uh, surprised me that was on, the, on my first Google page was uh, Tili in Samoan. And yeah, well, of course, I, I, I use a personalized Google account, and they have observed me, and they have seen that he's looking for Samoan, and now they give me Samoan. It's quite scary. <laughs> so use, use anonymizers when you use Google. Now suppose you have never looked for Samoan words, try very long words, especially if these words show up 
more than once in this text. Um, uh, well, long words means that they have to contain at least three syllables, uh, possibly more. Yeah, we've done that. Here are uh, frequent long words. Gagana and, oh, what's that? Fa aperetania. And yeah, it's quite easy there. Well, it's difficult to get uh, a dictionary of some moment. Um, uh, if you look for dictionaries of Samoan in university libraries, uh, you will find a Samoan grammar from Norway, and it contains a glossary. So you, well, that, that could be helpful, but it takes six weeks till the book reaches your university library if you are not uh, in Berlin or so. <coughs> yeah, <coughs> so you can use the internet, of course and look for Gagana and Fara Peritania. Uh, and you find, well, Gagana, I think, was my eighth Google uh, hit. Um, well, the, 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 well the, the eighth Google hit contained a translation, and Fara Peritania was the eleventh Google hit. hit. Well, well, the eleventh Google hit contained a translation. So Fara Peritania means English, and Gagana means language. So, uh, it seems that this text is about the English language. And you have here Gagana, Farah Peritania, Isamoa. And I would say that this means the English language in Samoa. <coughs> I thought Latu would be quite helpful, but this word is too short. Um, it's grammar. After some time, I found out that it is uh, the third person plural uh, pronoun of Samoan. Actually, I found that out thanks to the French Wikipedia that contained that word. Strange. Later on, I, I, I tried other words, and tagat, tagata worked. Tagata is, uh, means people or person. So uh, tagata Samoa, people from Samoa. And uh, tagata olivasa pacifica, seems to mean people from the Pacific Ocean or something like that. So, uh, obviously this text is about uh, English in Samoa, in the world, in the Pacific region, and yeah, perhaps that is not so very interesting, it's not about terrorists, so <laughs> we don't need to get a translation if we are looking for terrorists. If you're interested in uh, linguistics, of course, we may want to get a translation. It's quite easy to get a translation because uh, after some time you find out that this is uh, um, <coughs> this text comes from Wikipedia, of course, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's a text about some more. And if you compare it to uh, uh, earlier versions of the English Wikipedia, you can guess that it is a translation from English, and yeah, then you know what it is about. Yeah, that's uh, more or less what I wanted to show you. Now, there's time enough to get to, to, for your questions and for some discussion. So, please, yeah, say something. Hello, hello, yeah. hello, Martin. Yeah, if, if, you, if you get the microphone, then yeah, uh, okay. Um, try to get hold of the microphone, and I try to listen to you and excellent. find an answer. Excellent. I have a, a, a qu quite quick question. How would you try and use some of those techniques um, on a system like, for instance, the Kipu system from uh, um, that the Incas used, which is um, a system of not um, knotted cords, for instance. Is there, is there, are, there, are there some techniques that you, can, that you can use to try and decipher that? Yeah, well, um, <laughs> uh, well it depends what you want, uh, want to do. If you, well, you, you can, well, you, you can try to, 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 to but the idea is that you work on uh, already deciphered languages. And ah, okay. I don't <laughs> think that the Inca 
code of knots is deciphered, but I'm, I'm not a specialist on that. There's one interesting thing, and I, I thought I uh, could have shown that to you, which concerns Inca. Inca use um, um, uh, portraits, small portraits of people as uh, um, signs for numbers. Yeah, and that Picti is pictograms. Pictogra pictograms. And that is quite interesting. And, um, well, with numbers, it's, uh, well, it's a smaller set, and they combine in a certain way, and you can figure out how it works rather easily. Yeah. So, but, but, you know, that's numbers and not uh, uh, the quick words. Thought, you know? yeah. it's the not quick thought that I had was yeah. that uh, um, Quechua, the spoken language, has been mm. transcribed into the Roman character set. And by doing frequency analysis between the quipus and the um, uh, uh, Quechua, uh, a known Quechua text or, or, or oral legend, and you assume that the, wor the word frequency is about the same, you might be able to do some sort of comparative analysis. Oh, yeah, that, that sounds interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so there's a yeah, PhD well, for you. This is <laughs> Is well known, so that is not a problem. Yeah, it's yeah, it's it's a good idea. I would do that. Yeah. So, so uh, my question refers to your part about. Uh... Other questions? Yes. Yeah. Is it is it working? Yeah. So um, about this compression method thing. I I can't hear you. Is it, is it working? Yeah. No? Yeah. Well, well, about this compression method thing, yeah. um, if I got it right, you can use it um, for comparing text types as yeah. well as um, identifying the yeah. language. It works for which both. Yeah. Which means that, <coughs> the, um, yeah, that the text type influences the output. Mm -hmm. If so, um, this also implies that we need to know the kind of text type in order to identify the language, yeah. which seems to be kind of a circle because usually we would expect to, to know the language in order to identify the text type. I mean, of course, if we receive an email, we know text type email, but if we have a mm. book, we don't know if it's about computers, about mm. yeah, a novel or whatever. So how to solve this kind of vicious circle thing? Yeah, yeah that's, that's, uh, uh, that is a problem. Actually, the text type thing turned up when I when I uh, <coughs> tried uh, when I experimented with the approach myself, and uh, the problem is that, uh, for example, in French emails, well, French emails are so different from written French texts because, well, first of all, there's the problem of uh, character encoding uh, with accented letters and so on. That this is really well, the, the difference was very big, uh, but. Uh, I would say that, in general, if you don't know anything about um, the language and want to identify it with this me method, you get very close. Because um, at least um, the, French, the, the, the French emails I work with came within the range of Romance languages. So the mix-up was some well, was between uh, Spanish and French and so on. So you know, there's always a language family thing. So you get quite close. The, the, for for language identification, the difference between the different texts are sort of a nuisance. You know, but uh, uh, but which is not too harmful. So you still get a good idea uh, what language the text is in, and then. I got to the idea that uh, one can use the, the same method for the identification of text source. That's not in the literature. So in the literature, you only read that if the text comes from a very different uh, source, there may be difficulties. And then I thought, well, it's a good idea to uh, um, use it for text source. That's, that is the, the, the reason why I think that the idea is original enough to get a software patent on it. 
Um, <coughs> you uh, showed in your lecture um, that there are already uh, some programs or code to um, distinguish the language that is the text in, but is there already an implementation for uh, the second part of your lecture no. for, for determining that? Or do you, do you plan something like that, or does somebody plan mm. something like that? Mm. So as far as I know, there's no implementation for the second part. At least, well, there, there can be some implementation, but uh, I don't know that. I, I guess that uh, Google has something like that because they must know what language uh, somebody's interested in. Uh, so why could they know that I was interested in Samoan at some point? Well, that, that, there must be something like that. But I don't really know that there is, uh, I don't really know a computer implementation of the second part. The second part is, let's say, what linguists do when they. Uh, look at texts, uh, they, they look at uh, numbers, typographically uh, uh, interesting words and so on, and then they try to make a guess. We did that in Cologne when I studied linguistics there. We had a um, course on uh, uh, Guarani, and uh, there was no material on Guarani, and we had to, to find out uh, something about Guarani, and we had a Guarani speaker who came once a week, so we prepared our transcriptions and then we tried to find out things with him. And yeah, of course, that, that was exactly that way that I showed to you, but I don't know of any uh, implementation. There is a hint if you are looking at HTML. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah? Did I interrupt you? No, I, I just uh, thought of the second part. Perhaps I will do a project on that, and perhaps I will try to find to, to, to work on an implementation. But I don't know yet. So, if you're looking at HTML text, it's a good hint to look at the source code. Just in the beginning, in good HTML, there is a language code, and sometimes it's true. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Also, it's a good hint to learn foreign scripts. Mm -hmm. I read. Uh, Cyrillic script pretty well, and I could very well identify words that help to identify language in all Cyrillic script languages, which I found, which is pretty many. Mm -hmm. um, I always stumble about uh, dates, apparent dates, which I can't read because they are in some index scripts, mm -hmm. and I'm going to learn that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. about this uh, compression thing, uh, since <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, it, since, since compression uh, reduces redundancy or, or removes redundancy from data, uh, does that any, say anything about the redundancy in languages? Because uh, since language has a lot of redundancy, uh, so we can understand each other. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, of course. <laughs> there is lots of redundancies, and one can reduce that. Actually, redundancy is sort of a problem with um, this approach. I, I, had, I prepared another text of this um, kind that came from, from Basque, and then I uh, thought it was not a good idea to show that because due to redundancies, some uh, verb forms are so long that you think that, are, that they are content words. And, uh, well, you, you, you realize that when you put it into a, uh, your favorite search engine. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, it shows that life is not so easy. You know, that, uh, yeah. But, of course, redundancies are in every language, and they are useful for communication. They are not so useful if you really want to strip everything off and only have the, the uh, direct access to information, of course. Yeah, but uh, what I meant was, uh, is the, uh, the compression rate uh, 
let's say in, in German maybe it's it's uh, 43 percent, and uh, in in Italian it's uh, 75. Can you say <laughs> that no, 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 uh, no, no, Italian no. That, has no. more redundancies in it uh, no, than no, German you, or something You can't like that. say that. No, no, no? That, that, okay, that's that. not uh, measurable. <laughs> okay, that was my question. Okay, hi Martin. I'm over here. Hi. Um, you're Maybe. talking. You, the languages you've been talking about are ones that you already have that you can sort of read in front of you. What if you had a digital text that you would, a, a digital file that you assume is a text, but you don't know the coding for it? Yeah. You don't know whether it's in any of the uh, Unicode whatever things. Do hmm. uh, you just try through all the different ones? But as you can get interesting things in Chinese and Devangali and whatever, hmm. do you know of any way of going about with that? Yeah, I would, try, I would try the compression approach for that. Because with the compression approach, you don't really have to, to uh, know how to read the text. You know, if in your database there is a text uh, which well, it has to be in the same compression, uh, in, the, in, in the same uh, encoding, of course, then you can match them. Because if, if there's no model in your database, you won't get a result. But that, I would try that, because for that approach, it's not even necessary that you read the text. That's why it's interesting for spam detection, too, because you don't have to, to read the, uh, the email messages. You just take them as uh, randomly <laughs> encoded texts and can compare them. Just something that came to my mind to your confession method. Uh, I think the German police or BKA, um, this could also be helpful to them because after they searched for terrorists on Google, they could verify them using your compression method. Yeah, of course they can, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. of course, yeah. Well, I, I, personally, th I personally think that, uh, um, let's say from uh, our perspectives, uh, uh, the world is full of uh, intelligence, agen intelligence agencies and police departments that are using nifty methods to uh, find terrorists. But I think uh, uh, people who really need such approaches, like, well, for example, the, the second part of my talk, uh, other people, uh, people to, that, that want to, well, the firms like Google that have to, to treat very many uh, texts from very many different languages and have to know at least some, uh, have to, to get at least some idea what these texts are about. So for them, that, well, this, this approach is interesting. And uh, I would say that uh, police and intelligence agencies are, well, can use these methods too and will use these methods too. But, but they aren't the, 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 those who profit in the first place. And that, that, that aren't, well, they, they, well, I think they can rely on their traditional methods as well. And they will perhaps rely on these methods too. <coughs> More questions? Okay, sorry, I don't want to add any more questions. There are many things I think of uh, what, you, what you now started with is uh, the thing I'm very impressed of. I want to thank you for uh, bringing this issue into the Chaos Hackers Conference and uh, putting up linguistic hacking. It's a world of, uh, you, you will never finish in doing that. Uh, as just the, the young guy there, he said, uh, BKA is using it, maybe we could uh, use your approach. I think it's, you know, everybody knows, it's very important to know the tools of the enemy. And I see this in, a, in, a, in, in something like data mining yeah. methods. That is, that is the they are the, the most popular and important uh, now tools and technologies for 
identifying and uh, spies, mm -hmm. and I see that also as a counter spy approach. But I don't want to mm -hmm. leave it in it in this corner. I love languages. Mm -hmm. I only want to finish with because probably because you said you're a uh, because you're a Wikipedian. You forgot to say that Wikipedia itself, it's one of the biggest, best uh, tools for fans of language. And you can play with Wikipedia and different uh, languages, different symbols and signs uh, yeah. without the end. That's, and thank, thank you very you. much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you for that remark. Actually, Wikipedia gives you a, a corpus for more than 200 languages, and perhaps not because some Wiki, Wikipedias are so small, but at least for more than 100 languages, which is quite a lot, and that, that can be helpful. But just to come back to the, B, um, to the police thing, uh, to the BK, BKA, I think for them it's not so uh, efficient to use just these approaches because well, I don't know much about what terrorists do, but I, I believe the terrorists don't write uh, openly that they put a bomb there and there at that hour. So, you know, I, I would say that, that uh, in such fields they use at least some sort of steganography or something like that. To, to hide what they want to say. So even in a uh, completely innocent text about the, la the English language in Samoa, there might be a hidden meaning. Uh, <clears throat> so perhaps it's not enough to, do, to, to use such techniques if you, if you want to do a police or intelligence uh, uh, investigation. Um, the, the thing with the P BKA is, uh, I think, not to know what uh, the language is about, but uh, if you find a letter, for example, yeah. then you can trace it back to the original. Yeah. And for uh, that approach, yeah, the, 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 um, this uh, compression thing uh, approach is interesting if you can determine uh, similarities between texts and then you can use it to identify perhaps uh, an author or so. Uh, okay, I've got one remark. Uh, as, uh, ah. as you uh, shown this uh, Samoa example, uh, I think this is, uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, there is Samoa words because uh, most Samoan uh, texts are written in, uh, by linguistics or uh, another scientist uh, interested in language. For example, if you take Polish, uh, Polish text, uh, you wouldn't, uh, uh, you wouldn't uh, find uh, many Polish texts which uh, com contain yeah. pol Polska, Polski uh, mm. and uh, other, uh, and other uh, such uh, words. Uh, so uh, let's assume that uh, someone language uh, gets momentum and uh, everyone in this room uh, learns someone. Uh, so as uh, as number of people uh, talking with this language grows, uh, it will be less uh, less text about text, but more text about real life and so on. So in such case, it would be uh, necessary to switch to another uh, another method of recognizing this language. Yeah, of course, but still, you know, even in a, a Polish text, you may have capitalized words which uh, are names or so, which can help you to, to, to uh, get it identified. Uh, yes. Because the name, but you may uh, be able to find a name in uh, Wikipedia, for example. And that can show you, oh, well, that's a guy from Poland, so he, uh, this text can be Polish. Oh. At least to, yeah. But uh, um, the Samoan thing, well, I don't, don't know whether it's always linguists that write about uh, Samoan and mention Samoa. Uh, my impression is that uh, people from Samoa, especially when they write, they are very much interested in, uh, well, they are newspapers, for example. Uh, 
on uh, where you find uh, in the World Wide Web you find Samoan newspapers, and it's obvious that uh, um, they are interested in things going on in Samoa. That's why they mention Samoa so often. And I think even in Polish newspapers on the internet, uh, they will mention Poland because Polish newspapers are primarily interested in things going on in Poland. More questions? Oh, ah, yes. I think we have time for at least one question. Uh, I think uh, Google is a nice tool to um, solve problems, and uh, yeah. there you use the language to do this. And when I uh, have a problem, I go to Google and solve it there, uh, of fast, often faster than do it by myself. And uh, now uh, I need some tips how I can solve problems uh, faster by using other languages. So uh, do you have some tips uh, to use uh, information from China, something like this, to solve my problems in Google? I didn't get your point. Um, <laughs> sorry, my English isn't so good. Um, when, when you're looking for a problem, uh, or you have a problem, you want to solve it in Google. You find several places where you can find the, so, uh, the solution for your problem. And uh, it's only in German or English. Mm -hmm. And now there is a, a land like uh, China, which much people, uh, and you need this language to solve your problems faster than by doing it on your own. Ah. Ah. And tips to do this fast. Uh, if I can interpret your, your question. For example, you, you're looking for, for the solution of a problem and you find a, a large amount of texts in Chinese and you want to check whether these texts are useful in order to solve your problem. All yeah, right. Yeah, then you can use my method. Um, well, you can make use of Zip's law with the complexity of the science and so on to, to find important words and look them up in your dictionary and uh, see whether this text is useful to solve your problem or not. And if uh, you get the impression that the text might be useful, then of course you need a translator because you won't get enough detailed information by my method, especially from Chinese, uh, with that dirty uh, translation uh, approach. So you really have to get a specialist then. So that's a sort of a drawback. I cannot really, uh, with my method, you cannot really get the solution, uh, or you won't, well, probably you won't get the solution from the Chinese text. Um, I was wondering about the practical applications of, of language identification because just from what's going through my head, I, don't, I think there's very few circumstances where you would just have um, a text that you don't have any context about where it's coming from, but you know the encoding, uh, the character encoding and things like mm. that. Mm. Um, usually I would, if it's from a Polish newspaper, I would you know, at least sort of know geographically where that text is coming from. Mm. Or is it just basically a... Uh, what you presented here, a simple example of general text classifications, because there's not really much of a difference in identifying the language and um, kind of identifying the type of text it is. Yeah, well, it depends on, on, on what you want to do. Um, I have that problem very often, that I, I, I get a text and I have no idea uh, what language it is in. And for example, people who uh, are interested in, in, uh, in the blogosphere, for example, get texts uh, written in a strange language, and uh, well, they want to know whether this is well, interesting, uh, whether, whether they should link to this text or not. And um, I think for analysis, analyses of the blogosphere, um, 
the problem turns up quite often that you have to that you don't know what a language is, uh, what language a text is in, and want to get an idea, and want to get an idea of the contents too. Um, of course, well, it always depends on what you're doing, and in some, uh, well, of course, with uh, uh, other problems, you usually, well, you can get uh, HTML uh, information, as uh, somebody has said before on the language and so on, and it's uh, much easier to know where the text comes from and what language it is in. It is in. Yeah, I think time's up. Two minutes? Yeah, one question. Sure. <laughs>